Ubiquity, the history of designs we take for granted. Created by Chris Whitwood. For many companies across the world, Christmas means big business, and few businesses are as closely associated with the festive season as the Coca-Cola Company. Dressed in red velvet trimmed with white fur, Haddon Sunbloom's paintings of a jolly-faced Santa Claus raising a glass of Coke have become so iconic that for many, adverts for the fizzy brown beverage are synonymous with the image of Christmas itself. These advertising campaigns have been so successful that they have even spawned the myth that our modern idea of a red and white Father Christmas was invented by Coca-Cola. In reality, the artist Haddon Sundblom himself stated that he drew inspiration from Clement Clark Moore's poem, A Visit from St Nicholas, better known as Twas the Night Before Christmas. Coca-Cola was not even the first soft drinks company to utilise the image. White Rock Beverages had used cartoons of Santa Claus to advertise mineral water as early as 1915, the year another ubiquitous icon of design took shape. Even at the turn of the 20th century, the Coca-Cola logo was one of the most recognisable in America. It had been designed by Frank Mason Robinson, bookkeeper to Coke's inventor John Pemberton. Robinson drew on the Spenserian script that was the dominant formal writing style of the era to create the sweeping cursive text. Yet while the logo was rapidly pervading American society, the straight-sided bottles in which Coke was sold were far more run-of-the-mill. This was a problem. Not only were competitors such as Coca-Cola, Marco Coca, Toca-Cola and even Coke with a K deliberately imitating Coca-Cola's name and branding, to keep bottles chilled, they were often sold from barrels of ice-cold water. This frequently caused labels to peel off, leaving the brand unidentifiable. In response, Coca-Cola Bottling Company distributed a note through the business, urging members to join forces in developing a distinctive package for the product. Three years later, the trustees of the company directed $500, a not insignificant sum in 1915, to be spent researching ideas for a new and distinctive bottle. On the morning of Monday the 28th of June 1915, the telephone rang in the mould shop of the Root Glass Company of Terre Haute, Indiana. The call was answered by the shop foreman and bottle designer Earl R. Dean. After a brief exchange, Dean hurried upstairs to the office of his boss, Chapman J. Root. The Root Glass Company had been bottling Coca-Cola since 1904 and had just received a new creative request. It had been sent to 30 or so companies and the brief within was indeed that. Their task was to design a bottle so distinctive you would recognise it by feel in the dark or lying broken on the ground. Dean was met in the office by Root along with his secretary Roy Hurt, John B. Hodgson Clyde Edwards and plant superintendent Alexander Samuelson. The six of them began brainstorming ideas. It was during this discussion that the Swedish-born Samuelson asked what Coca-Cola was made from. Whilst the precise formula remains a closely guarded trade secret, the two primary ingredients as alluded to by the name were the cocoa leaf and the cola nut. With that spark of inspiration, Dean and Edwards were dispatched to the local library. Upon arrival, their attention turned to the 11th edition of that great repository of human knowledge, the Encyclopaedia Britannica. Unfortunately, the Encyclopaedia did not contain an illustration of either ingredient, nor did any of the other books they scoured. What they did find, however, was a picture of the similarly spelled, but botanically very different, Coco. Unconcerned, or perhaps unaware, of this difference, and enthused by references to cacao, the bean from which cocoa is derived, being used in Mayan and Aztec culture to produce the drink of the gods, Dean made a quick sketch of the cacao pod, and the pair returned to the factory. The shape of the pod is distinctive, but time was pressing. On the last working day of the month, the molten glass tanks in the factory were required to shut down for cleaning and inspection. 
This gave Dean until noon on Wednesday the 30th, just two days, to transform his initial idea into a physical reality. Remarkably, Dean not only succeeded in drawing up a design, but also carving a mould in time for a dozen prototypes to be produced. The first designs had a flaw, however. Mimicking the shape of the cacao pod meant that the middle of the bottle curved out further than the diameter of the base. This upset the centre of gravity and made the bottles unstable on the conveyor belts used during production. To rectify this, Dean narrowed the middle to improve balance. Slight alterations were also made to meet Coca-Cola's specifications regarding weight and volume. Within seven weeks of the initial meeting, Root had applied for a patent and Coca-Cola's Contour bottle had been born. Dean was offered a $500 bonus or a job for life. He chose the latter. The manufacturing process for the Contour bottle mirrors that of the majority of other mass-produced glass bottles. Molten glass is sliced into cylindrical gobs of the precise quantity required to make one bottle. The gobs are fed into an initial mould, which forms a small, solid version of the bottle called a parison. This is then transferred to a blow mould, which uses compressed air to blow the glass out to take its final shape. One way in which Dean's design helped fulfil the brief of making a bottle that could be recognised by feel in the dark, as well as solving the problem of labels peeling off, was by recessing Coca-Cola's logo into the mould, meaning it would be embossed on the side of every bottle. Another recognisable feature is the colour of the glass itself. Originally, Coca-Cola had used clear or brown bottles. By contrast, the Contour bottle contained iron 2 oxide, giving it a shade known as German Green, which was later given the more patriotic name Georgian Green, as a nod to Coca-Cola's state of origin. There is one last festive note to this story. The patent for Coca-Cola's Contour bottle was renewed in 1923. It was customary at the time for patents to be issued on a Tuesday. It just so happened that the last Tuesday of the year, and therefore the new date stamped on the side of every bottle, was December the 25th. Some ubiquitous designs are the result of tireless research and development by an individual. Others the result of an accident or an uncanny stroke of luck. The Coca-Cola Contour bottle is an example of a collaborative design process. Though today the design is generally credited to Earl Ardine, his work was part of a joint effort. Though selling the bottles highlighted a problem that needed to be solved. Root's oversight, Samuelson's question and Edward's research all provided stepping stones to Dean's design. It is rare that designs are created in isolation. Instead, they build on previous research, develop existing products, and bring together the ideas of others to create something new and unique. The Coca-Cola Contour bottle is no exception. Thank you for listening to Ubiquity, the history of designs we take for granted. Please like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also follow the series on social media using the handle ubiquity underscore pod on Twitter and Instagram or search Ubiquity Podcast on Facebook. All episodes will be available on YouTube. Please leave a like and a comment as I'd love to hear your feedback and your ideas for future episodes. If you want to support the podcast financially or just say thank you, please visit the Ubiquity Podcast Patreon at patreon.com forward slash ubiquity underscore pod. Patrons will also gain access to all of the scripts as episodes are released and will be able to vote on subjects for episodes in upcoming series. I hope you enjoyed this episode and thank you once again for listening.